thank you very much for the invitation to talk here today. Um, my apologies ahead of time. I'm a keynote speaker and I tried to convert to PowerPoint this morning to get the captions, but I failed. So I'm giving this with a keynote. Um, so it'll be sadly caption free. Um, uh, I've probably got a lot too many slides to talk about in this session here, but I'll do my best and um, you'll have the slides at the end and I'm happy to answer any questions offline. Now, um, to start off, we think about why we're going to do mixed precision anyway in HPC. There's, of course, many reasons. Um, uh, current GPUs and other hardware have acceleration specifically for low precision. Um, but there are other reasons as well, such as reducing memory traffic, reducing network traffic, reducing memory footprint. And also, sometimes you want to change the precision um, for suitable numerical properties. I don't just mean going from single precision to double precision, but also using things in integer instead of uh, floating point, for example. And the whole goal of using mixed precision is really to accelerate or improve the algorithms without compromising the quality of science to accelerate the time to science. So the case study we'll be talking about today is lattice quantum chromodynamics, uh, QCD. Um, I'm not going to tell you much about what QCD is other than it's the science of subnuclear physics. And um, QCD is the theory of the strong force which binds together the neutrons and the protons. It's a very simple theory to write down. We have a path integral here. It's a very beautiful theory. Um, unfortunately, it's a highly nonlinear theory. You can't solve it by using Feynman diagrams. That essentially means you can't use a Taylor expansion to make predictions, and you have to resort to numerical methods. Um, lattice quantum chromodynamics is the method of choice. Um, here, you take the infinite space time and we put it on a finite periodic box. So we end up with a four dimensional grid with periodic boundary conditions. And the original partial differential equations. Um, are now turned into finite difference equations, which means stencils um, on a regular grid. And we have to solve problems of the form AX equals B. So A is a, is a large sparse matrix, X and B are vectors. Now it's important um, in, in, in this conversation here because it's a very large consuming of, consumer of public supercomputing cycles. So 10 plus percent of supercomputing cycles in North America, in Europe, in Japan, and increasing so in um, China and India. So it's traditionally very highly optimized on every HPC platform that's been around for the last 30 years. Uh, in the US specifically, we can see why we care about this. Um, on the two pie, pie charts on the left, we're looking at the utilization or the allocation and utilization on the Summit machine at Oak Ridge by Lattice QCD. Um, they have uh, in Insight 2019, the approximately one sixth of all cycles were allocated to them. But because Lattice QCD is always ready to absorb any cycles available, they actually took more like 35%, um, 40% of all cycles in Summit were spent doing Lattice QCD. Um, NERSC is a bit more conservative in giving time to QCD physicists. It's more like 13%. There you can see it's split between the applications Chroma, CPS, and MILK. So it's an important application to optimize for in HPC centers. Um, there's two major steps in a Lattice QCD calculation. There's a large, strong scaling Monte Carlo phase and a second phase where you take all the configurations which are generated by this Monte Carlo um, um, metropolis uh, strong scaled algorithm, and you analyze all these configurations. So step one requires strong scaling, running on leadership facilities. Step two is a task parallel job that can be done on a smaller scale or a more easily parallelizable scale. So it's much more task parallel. Um, but both of these steps um, require solving this AX equals B problem, this problem in the top right here. Um, AX equals B, whereas A is the uh, discretized um, Dirac operator or Dirac stencil. So in a nutshell, what Lattice QCD is, you, you run your simulations, you strong scale them, you're strong scaling the stencil problem on many GPUs or many processors, whichever your architecture of choice is. You, you run your simulations, you come up with predictions, you then compare them, on the other hand, to experimental results, such as what comes out of Large Hadron Collider um, in, in Geneva, and ideally, you're looking for deviations between theory and experiment because that's the sign of new physics. Um, so what CUDA is, is the application I work on. CUDA is a library which accelerates Lattice QCD on GPUs. Um, it's written using modern C++, using CUDA C or CUDA C++, and it provides acceleration for all these major Lattice QCD applications which absorb all the time on the leadership facilities. So the ones to point out here are Chroma and Milk and uh, CPS. And what we talk, what we use a lot is mixed precision methods to optimize performance. So that's what I'll talk about now. Um, it's really much a research tool to, or how to reach the exascale using algorithms and techniques. 
So here are some of my contributors towards the library or my collaborators. The folks I highlight in red here are um, all the folks that work at NVIDIA. We have quite a few former QCD physicists coming to uh, NVIDIA. So mixed precision cool of solvers, what we're really talking about today. So we have this Dirac stencil. Um, it's a sparse matrix, essentially a sparse matrix problem. And like any sparse matrix problem or any stencil problem for that, on that hand, it's very um, memory bandwidth bound. So the, the arithmetic intensity is quite low. It's around one in single precision. So on any modern architecture, you're going to be very memory bandwidth bound in what performance you can get. So what we have to do is maximize the arithmetic, arithmetic intensity using whatever technique possible. Um, the main technique I'm going to talk about here is using uh, low precision. So going from single precision to 16-bit uh, precision, you immediately double your performance in terms of gigaflops um, because you're memory bandwidth bound. Uh, so here's an example of some uh, performance scaling just to demonstrate this. Um, we're looking, we're increasing the size of the box here, L, it's just the number of grid points. We're comparing double precision and single precision. And you can see double precision saturates 700 gigaflops. Single precision doubles the performance and that's purely because of the memory uh, traffic has halved and so we double the performance. We also have the 16-bit fixed point format I just alluded to. We don't actually use FB16. We use a custom fixed point format for more precision because we want dynamic range over the grid but we need more mantissa bits on each grid point. So we use what's, what some people call a block float format. Each of the grid points um, is actually a vector of 12 complex numbers. We use a, um, so we, we use that, we store that vector of 12 complex numbers using a 16-bit fixed point format with a normalizer like an FP32 to set the scale. So over the whole grid, we have dynamic range of FP32, but locally we have 16 bits of Mantissa. This gives us a combination of precision and range, which helps with the stability of the numerical solvers. So I'm using this only as a storage format, not the actual computation, which is done in FP32. So it's load and store and low precision, do compute in FP32. And you can see here that the stencil performance effectively doubles when you do this. This blue line here is showing the comparison uh, of half precision or the 16-bit fixed point versus single and double. And you can see each time you have the precision representation, you double the performance or more or less double. You actually slightly sometimes increase the performance more than a factor of two. And that's shown on the right-hand side here with the effective uh, memory bandwidth that each thread is achieving. And this is because um, we, we achieve more than the memory bandwidth of the device, which in this case is 900 gigabytes per second peak. And that's because you have L2 reuse, lots of locality in the problem. And the L2 in the GPU is very good at capturing the locality of the stencil. Now, it's all really great having a low precision stencil, but it doesn't help unless you have a, um, if it, unless it improves your time to solution. And the time to solution must be measured against solving some high, high precision problem. So you want your actual solver to go to double precision accuracy or something close to double precision accuracy. So we're in the entire CG solver, by CG stab solver, multi-grid solver, et cetera, on the GPU. As we, reduce the, as we reduce the quark mass, this is the parameter which is fed into the stencil, which affects the condition number. And, and as we reduce that parameter towards where reality is, what happens is the condition number blows up and it eventually becomes singular. And so as you make the problem more realistic, the, the condition number becomes harder and you have to treat the numerical solver with much more care as to how you converge that solver in using low precision most of the time, but still getting the high performance, the high precision result. Um, so you have to be careful not to violate the no, uh, you have to be careful, otherwise you, uh, you, do, and you do not end up with a no free lunch. So in the context of conjugate gradient, we found there was four key ingredients to have a high precision solver be doing most of the work with low precision. Um, now the traditional approach when you use iterative solvers um, is to use something called defect correction or iterative refinement. You have an inner ultra solver where you solve uh, an inner system to using low precision. You, you finish that solver. So say you finish the inner CG solver to 10 to the minus four accuracy or 10 to the minus five accuracy. Then you calculate the outer residual in high precision. And then you restart and uh, you restart the system and do another inner solve with low precision. And then you keep repeating that until you've converged. Unfortunately, when you do this, you throw away the um, generated Krilov space that the solver will have generated. And you end up doing many more iterations to reach convergence. So we use something different, which is called reliable updates, which is an old technique developed in the 90s to improve numerical stability by CG stab. But it allows us to keep the Krilov space resident, but do most of the work in low precision while maintaining high performance, high precision. I refer you to the paper here 
um, for more details. We also had a few other important ingredients, such as reprojecting the residual vector, sorry, reprojecting the um, direction vector in, in, against the residual vector every time you do one of these flying updates. You have to make sure the solution vectors are always stored in double precision. Even though you're doing most of the work in half precision, you need to make sure the cumulative solution vector is always done in double precision. And in, in a, in a thing we inherited from nonlinear CG was to use a different form for calculating the beta coefficient, which is um, identical in infinite precision, but it's, it's more numerically stable, um, it's self-stabilizing in fact, and it improves the orthogonality of back-to-back -back iterations in conjugate gradient. And what we're looking at here is a comparison of, in, in green, a pure double precision conjugate gradient solve, doing some number of iterations, trying to converge to 10 to the minus seven accuracy. If you just plug in naive low precision um, conjugate gradient um, without these recipe I just described, then you end up with a spiky black behavior. If you use this recipe I described, however, you get this nice smooth red line. So you get some small overhead and iteration count, but you can still converge to your target system um, and, uh, and get the free lunch that you desire. You can see here the condition number of the systems 10 to the four. As we make the condition number of the system uh, higher, so increase it by two orders of magnitude, what you see is that the original naive conjugate gradient solver didn't converge at all. You just got this mess of convergence, this black line here. And in fact, it never converged. You just, predict, you just got this oscillating behavior. The red behavior is of the stabilized solver. And you'll see, although it's a, not as stable as the green, uh, pure double precision result, we still achieve the target accuracy um, just with a small overhead, a 10% overhead in iterations. If you plug that into the actual solver, you can see the actual speed up you get from using this more careful tech, uh, use of precision. So double precision, going down to double single, going down to double half, where double half gets the best overall um, time solution in this milk application. So here, you know, using the mixed precision was an important, um, like these milk calculations can run for months at a time. So this can you know, equate to knocking off weeks off a calculation. We went down to 16-bit precision. It's interesting to think about how low can we go in this precision? Can we go down all the way down to 8-bit? And uh, can we still converge that conjugate gradient solver? Uh, and the plot on the right here, I'm just showing the performance of double single half and now quarter. You can see quarter improve performance again on a voltage GPU, not quite the factor of two now because other things are coming in like indexing overheads and um, load store instruction overheads and things like that. You can still see we get a nice boost in gigaflops, but when we actually look at the solver and whether it converges or not, what we see that in the regime of physical interest, which is uh, shown in this pink area of this plot here, um, on the x-axis, I'm showing the condition number of the linear system. Um, this is the area we care about in terms of physics. And you can see that if we look at the iteration count um, on a logarithmic scale, um, looking at um, the double-double, uh, uh, double-single, double-half, and double-quarter, you can see that the first three of those all lie approximately on top of each other. So they all have an approximate iteration, so the similar iteration counts. You can see eventually double-half starts to diverge. But in the regime of physical interest, we basically keep the iteration count fixed. Whereas double-quarter, um, where we're trying to converge to double precision accuracy, doing most of the work in quarter precision, we just do not get there. Even at very easy to solve problems, you cannot converge it without a huge overhead. So 8-bit is a bridge too far. So 16-bit is where it's at, it would seem. Now let's switch to multigrid. Um, now multigrid is the, the optimal way to solve these types of stencil problems, and that's why we care about it. It's much faster, it's much more numerical stable, and it's optimal in terms of, uh, it is, it's flat with condition number. So as you change the condition number of your system, you have no increase in the number of, iter uh, number of iterations of your solver. And, and also it has order um, N scaling, which means as you double your problem size, um, you still your iteration count stays fixed as well. So this is the solver we really care about. Um, I'm not going to talk about the details of the form of the multigrid solver that's used for QCD, but it's a, it's a form of geometric multigrid with special adaptivity um, included and careful treatment of coarsening for non-hermeticity. Um, now, multigrid in some ways is the ideal algorithm for mixed precision. Each pass of multigrid, so each V-cycle, if you're familiar with multigrid, um, only reduces the, the residual it's an, by an order of magnitude. It's very much an approximate solver. Very often you would wrap it as a preconditioner for an ultra Krilov solver, or you'd or do multiple passes of multigrid steps to reach your target accuracy. So each iteration of multigrid doesn't have to be that accurate. Um, and so that allows you great freedom to reduce precision dramatically inside the multigrid solver. So the method that we were looking at was just to wrap the entire multigrid cycle 
um, sorry, do the entire multigrid cycle in 16-bit precision, and then wrap that in an outer GCR solver. So we keep the outer solver in single precision, um, and again, an outer precision outside of that in double precision to make sure we can co converge to final double precision accuracy. But again, most of the work's done in 16-bit precision. You get a nice reduction in peak memory, but the wonderful effect about doing multigrid in 16-bit precision is you have zero effect on the multigrid convergence. There is no effect at all on the iteration count, even as you go all the way down to that near singular point in terms of the condition number. Uh, a plot on the right-hand side here is showing one thing you do have to be careful with mixed precision is latency. So that your latency, latency stays fixed, of course, as you go from double to single to half. And as your performance goes faster, of course, that latency um, effect will become a bigger bigger overhead. So as if, if in multigrid you go to smaller and smaller grids as your solver coarsens, if you're going from 10 to 8 to 6 to 4 to 2, eventually you've got a very small problem size. You have no benefit from low precision because you're completely latency bound. You know, a, two, a 2 to the power of 4 grid does not saturate a GPU um, and so you don't get any benefit from the low memory, tra mem memory traffic. Um, Another interesting thing we found uh, in the multigrid setup. Uh, well, just Kate, um, uh, the the time of the talk uh, is reaching its end. Could you uh, wind sure. up in one minute? Yep, yep I'll be Thank I'll you. be quick. Um, so when we are doing coursing in multigrid, we would like to um, do it in parallel uh, using massive parallelism. Um, that's difficult if you have to add lots of numbers together. Um, so instead, we what we use is integer atomics because there we have determinism. Um, and associativity, and it means we always get the right answer, uh, sorry, we always get the same answer all the time, which is very beneficial. When you put all these things together, this optimized multigrid solver with four different precisions here, so double, single, half, and int32 for these different parts of the solver, you could see a significant speed up um, versus the, the solver we had before, going, going from Titan to Summit and changing the algorithm. We had an 82x speed up uh, altogether. Um, I won't talk about this plot here, other than to say 8-bit is actually stable with multigrid, unlike the case of CG. And so we can use 8-bit all the way down to, uh, you, we can use multigrid with 8-bit precision. Now, just wrapping up here, I just wanted to highlight some of the work we're doing with tensor cores. So tensor cores are these high throughput matrix multiplication instructions on the Volta and Ampere architectures. Um, specifically with extremely high throughput for low precision, such as FP16. We've been deploying these, uh, uh, this, these instructions to accelerate some of uh, the, accelerate some uh, throughput, to accelerate some calculations on the summit architecture. Um, what we see is that preconditioners, which are designed to reduce network communication, which are too expensive without tensor cores, are made um, possible now with tensor cores. Um, and as a result, you know, at large scales, we can use tensor cores to accelerate these large strong scaling workloads that would not be possible otherwise. And we turn a problem which were completely network bound now into being compute bound. Um, finally, just to highlight the fact that we're now looking at using tensor cores throughout different aspects of the Lattice QCD workflow. Um, what we recognize you know, after the fact is that many of these workloads are actually matrix multiplication. And so they, they are directly applicable to being reformulated into tensor cores. Um, so there's an ongoing work there to turn these um, matrix multiplication kernels as, uh, into explicit tensor core usage. And we see significant speed up when doing that. The, you know, what we expect when this work is done is we'll have a 2x throughput of Chroma running on Summit, for example. And as noted at the beginning, that's a significant overhead of what runs on Summit now. So if we can achieve the 2x speed up by using the tensor cores which are there, that's great. Um, just to conclude my final slides um, before I'm kicked off, um, I would just ad advise generally don't use double precision without considering what precision is actually required in the calculation. Judicious use of precision tuning can lead to large speed ups, more than 4x is what we've seen here. Um, and creativity is required, such as um, using integers uh, where necessary instead of floating point, um, using precision, uh, low precision as a storage format as opposed to just for, for computation. And some algorithms can utilize many more than you know, two precisions. Three, four precisions are sometimes the optimal approach to take, depending on the calculation. And future work that we're doing here is to recast a lot of these algorithms to take use of these tensor core uh, functionality, which is on current and future GPUs, to really give a scalable solution to the future. Okay, and on that, I thank you.